Morning, church. I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, and starting with verse 23. Matthew chapter 22, starting with verse 23. Sorry, let's start with verse 15, rather. Matthew 22, starting with verse 15. Let's bow our heads for prayer one more time. Heavenly Father, you've blessed us with life and health and strength. What a privilege it is to expend some of that life in your direct presence like this, worshipping, praising, giving you thanks. And we pray, Lord, that this morning you will bless us as we focus our attention upon your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, Matthew chapter 22 is quite interesting because we have a series of parables. And in those parables, basically, Jesus is confronting the Israelite people with God's ideal for them, and yet how they had failed to reach that ideal. You know, there's the story of the two sons. There's the story of the landowner who rents out his property, and then he comes back. He expects to receive a reward, but instead they mistreat the servants and kill the son. And then finally it climaxes with that amazing parable of the wedding supper. And so this is the context for what follows next. At the end of chapter 21, at the end of all those parables which were told in public to the common people in the hearing and in the presence of the religious leaders, it says the following, verse 45 of chapter 21. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Ooh, ouch. And basically, if you read those parables, it's not a very flattering account or opinion of his thoughts pertaining to their leadership. So they realize he's speaking about them, but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So if it was up to them and they were in private chambers, they would have laid hold of him and probably killed him right there, in other words. But because of the people and the fear of the uprising, they held their passions in subjection to the higher faculties of the mind. Okay. So, it goes on from there. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. The Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. So we already know the real motive for what they want to do to him, right? The motive is that he's exposing them in front of their following. He's exposing them as the liars and as the cheat, as the hypocrites that they really are. They haven't taken kindly to this, but they are scared to take him in front of the multitude, so they come up with a better plan. If we can trap Jesus in what he says, we might be able to get the Romans to do what we want to do in our behalf. Right? Verse 16. They sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and you teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Now this story is told in two other, two other of the Gospels, Mark chapter 12 and Luke chapter 20. And it's clear that what the disciples are saying to him in those other accounts, not his disciples, the, the Pharisees' disciples, what they're saying to him is, look, we know that you're no respecter of persons. You play no favorites. You just call it like it is. You have a track record of just saying it as it is. You know, call a spade a spade, call sin by its right name. And so really they're coming to him sort of with a little bit of flattery, sort of laying it on thick, buttering him up, psychologically trying to prepare him for the fact that they expect him to just say it like it is. Of course, the reason... They want him to say it like it is. It's not because they are learners in the school of Christ wanting to know the word of God, but because they are hoping that they can use this outspokenness of Jesus against him to humble him, to trap him. So they say, tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now that may seem like a strange question to you and I, but around about 6 AD, just a you know, decade or two before this question is asked, uh, around about 6 AD a census was taken because when Herod the Great died, that's the Herod that tried to kill Jesus, remember him? Right? When he died, Jesus and his parents were in 
Egypt, and then they were instructed by the angel to come back. Well, after Herod had died, his property, his territory was taken and divided amongst his three sons. And this area of Judea, where they are right at this moment when this discussion takes place, had been taken off of Herod's one son, Archelaus was his name, because he was so oppressive, so oppressive to the Jewish people in this area of Judea, that a mass Jewish uprising was about to take place. And so he was relieved, they would rather relieve Archelaus of his responsibilities as governor than have the Jews go into revolt, right? Now, up until that time, the Herods, this family of Herod, were Jewish in their religion. So paying taxes to Herod was not such a big deal because he was kind of on the right team anyway. But Judea had been relieved of this Jewish leadership and now in its place was flat outright Roman governance. That's a little bit of history for you. Here's another piece of the puzzle. There was a man named Judas of Galilee, not to be confused with Judas the disciple. Judas of Galilee was a bit of a radical, a revolutionary. And this Zionistic kingdom mentality had developed amongst the zealots and those who were rioting against the Roman Empire. And the thinking was this, we are supposed to be a theocracy. We are chosen by God. We are to be ruled by God directly. And no Gentile kingdom has the authority to rule over the chosen people of God, despite the fact that all the way through the Old Testament history, God himself, through the prophets, had told them that if you are sent into exile to the Gentiles because of your idolatry and disobedience to me, then you are to respect them as the authority that I have placed over you. They were to live in Babylon, plant, uh, plant vineyards, grow houses, not grow houses, grow vineyards, and plant, uh, build houses. You know what I'm trying to say, right? They were to live under these rulers as law-abiding citizens. But despite what the prophets had said, there was this mentality that had developed, this uprising mentality. It was like what we would call today liberation theology. If you know the various schools of theology, it was that liberation theology where you use the Bible to justify violence against the oppressor. Because they're wrong anyway. So it's okay for us to be a little bit wrong, to do what's right. Anyway, so this was what had happened. And Judas of Galilee was responsible in a large degree for spreading this mentality, this idea that the Romans were the oppressive force, the Gentiles, and if you were to pay taxes to the Romans, then you were disloyal to God, who was the ruler of the Israelites' theocratic kingdom. So we'll ignore what the prophets have told us, and we come up with this nice-sounding kingdom theology that if we pay taxes to the Roman governor, then we are in essence backing the side of Satan the enemy and we are betraying our trust and our loyalty to God. Now that is the political background that this question is asked in. Does that make sense to you? There's oppression, there is instability of government, there is this Jewish kingdom theology. This was a hot topic of theological debate in the schools where these disciples were coming from. Remember, they're, they're disciples, they're coming out of the theological classroom with their nice theological debates and they come to Jesus. So, what do you say about this hot topic? Now, had he given a yes or no answer, there was no way to not offend someone. And that was exactly their goal. Because if he took the side of the Romans, he would lose the loyalty of those who were part of this Judean thinking in regard to the enemy state. Suddenly, they would see Jesus as on the side of the enemy. On the other hand, if he kept the loyalty of the people by saying, no, you shouldn't pay taxes, then they've got him exactly where they want him. All they have to do is report this to the governor. And he would be arrested on account of sedition and causing uprising. That's a pretty tricky position to be in, isn't it? So Jesus, with his masterful wisdom, for which I admire him incredibly, asks for a Roman denarius, a silver coin, which is about the equivalent of one day's labor for an ordinary common laborer of the time. Now, there were other coins he could have asked for. There were copper or bronze coins. Each district minted its own coins, 
But there was one coin that was used throughout the Roman realm, and that was the denarius. It was a silver coin. And there was a specific reason why he asked for that coin and not any other coin. Verse 18. Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. You see, the coin that they used to pay tax to Caesar was the Roman coin. So he says, show me the coin that you pay the tax with. Not any other coin, the tax coin. So they brought him a denarius and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? Image and inscri inscription. Image being picture. Inscription being the words that are written there. And on both accounts, that coin belonged to who? Caesar, right? Whose face was on that coin? Caesar's face. To whom was the inscription to give glory to? Caesar. That coin belonged to the Roman state. It belonged to Caesar. They said to him, this is Caesar's. And he said to them, render. That means give back. Give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. It wasn't really a yes. It wasn't really a no. It was a question of recognizing ownership and jurisdiction. Jesus echoes the voice of the prophets. You know, you'll find this in Romans 13 verse 1. What does he say in Romans 13 verse 1? What is the relationship between the believer and the state powers to be? One of obedience and subjection. To be law-abiding citizens. Part of your Christian experience is to be loyal to the governments that are in charge. To render them, the, render them the respect necessary even, and this is the tough one, when they don't do what we want them to do or when they become oppressive. Strange. Strange. Because God is the one that sets up kings and brings down kings. Read Daniel chapter 2 for that idea. Interesting. Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God's the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled, they left him, and they went their way. Now the purpose of me sharing the story with you this morning is actually not so much to encourage you to pay taxes. The main burden of my message this morning is really not so much to, you know, back John Key and the Prime Ministry, the government systems and all of that. That's not really what I want to share with you this morning. Jesus was saying something far more subtle, something far more gospel-centered in what he said. He's talking about images and inscriptions, coins that bear the resemblance of the owner. Does that ring a bell? Where else do you find that language? The first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Let us create man. How? In our image. Every human being born into this world is born with the superscription, with the image of God engraved upon them. And while these religious leaders and scholastic theologians argued about loyalty to state governments, their heart was not surrendered to God and their very being bore His image. Jesus takes their logic. He takes their world. He shakes it upside down. He says, there is a far greater authority than Caesar. There is a far greater authority than the Labour government or the National Party to whom you ought to pay supreme allegiance. A coin, a coin is a thing of this world. A coin has the superscription of an earthly government that is there at, sometimes by the active blessing of God, sometimes by the permissive will of God. But those things are earthly. And when it comes to earthly things, do what you need to do to stay within the bounds of legality and law. Because a Christian ought to be a good citizen. A Christian ought to be someone who doesn't make waves by creating this Jewish system of uprising against governments. That's not what our work is. Our work... Our work 